A patron of mine, Nama, asked the following questions. I've been trying to find an explanation about why did the German people vote Hitler into power, or how ever did their system work back then? Hitler was popular, but why was that? What other political parties were there, and what were they offering? Usually Hitler's rise is seen as a failure of democracy, that Germans just happened to vote him into power. I doubt it's that simple. Your explanation of the diminishing markets, and also the similarities of communists and national socialists, makes a lot of sense. The fact that you're asking these questions is good, because it suggests that the traditional explanation for why the Nazis were popular doesn't make much sense to you. Which it shouldn't. Hitler's electoral success, particularly in the 1930 election, has left many historians scratching their heads. And the given reasons for this victory are pretty vague. For example, Richard Evans in The Coming of the Third Reich says, quote, Voters were not looking for anything very concrete from the Nazi party in 1930. They were, instead, protesting against the failure of the Weimar Republic. The vagueness of the Nazi program, its symbolic mixture of old and new, its eclectic, often inconsistent character, to a large extent, allowed people to read into it what they wanted to and edit out anything they might have found disturbing. Now, I don't know about you, but the only thing that sounds vague here is this explanation of why people from all social classes, as Evans points out, voted for the Nazis. The Nazi party had established itself with startling suddenness in September 1930 as a catch-all party of social protest, appealing to a greater or lesser degree to virtually every social group in the land. Okay. But there were plenty of other parties that they could have voted for. Yet, they specifically voted for the National Socialists. So, there has to be an actual reason why they did that. Not just because they wanted to protest the establishment by voting for a party which, supposedly, had vague policies. There's no given reason as to why everyone suddenly decided to vote for the same party. And... I'm not picking on Evans here. His is just the latest in a significant number of historical works. That can't explain it either. The Nazis' ideology and goals were always deliberately vague and always changing. Hitler announced the 25 points of the Nazi program with much fanfare in 1920 and sternly declared them unchangeable. He then ignored them and they bore little relation to what he did once he reached power. Well, this is a historian who hasn't read Mein Kampf. Now, these vague traditional historians are correct that the Great Depression led to an economic, political and social crisis that then led to the rise of National Socialist popularity. But again, that doesn't explain why lots of people suddenly and specifically voted for the Nazis. Yes, they may have voted against the main parties, but why throw in your lot with a party which only got 12 seats in the previous election, especially when it's not clear what that party really stands for? What the Nazis did not offer were concrete solutions to Germany's problems, least of all in the area where they were most needed, in economy and society. So, there's an economic, social and political crisis, and people are voting for the Nazis who offered no solutions at all to the crisis. Excuse me for being a little bit sceptical of your explanation here, but clearly... Many people wanted concrete solutions to the economic, social and political crisis of the Great Depression. They then voted for the National Socialists. So, it would make a lot more sense if the National Socialists were actually offering a solution to the crisis. Considering that 
when the depression hit, the chancellor, a guy from the Centre Party called Brüning, who was a conservative, laissez-faire loving capitalist, decided to cut back on government spending and decrease wages and prices. This was a deflationary policy designed to deepen the recession, but shorten it. He therefore reduced unemployment benefits, cut back on the welfare state and the civil service, thus there were lots of unemployed ex-public employees, and refused to raise taxes or create government-funded job creation schemes. All of these were classic economic policies designed to shorten the recession rather than let it drag out for 16 years like it did in the United States. Because of his cutting back policies, Brüning became known as the Hunger Chancellor. Thus, he and his policies were unpopular, the people wanted a change and a solution from the capitalist policies of old, and they voted for Hitler and the National Socialists. The 1919 constitution of the Weimar Republic created a state-of-the-art modern democracy, with a scrupulously just proportional election system and protection for individual rights and freedoms, expressly including the equality of men and women. Social and political activists fought with considerable success for even more Germany had the world's most prominent gay rights movement. It was home to an active feminist movement that, having just won the vote, was moving on to abortion rights. Campaigns against the death penalty have been so successful in Germany that, in practice, the axe was never used. At the beginning of the Republic, workers had won the eight-hour day with full pay. Jews from Poland and Russia were drawn to Germany's tolerance and openness. Unlike what we have today in the UK or in the United States, the Weimar Republic had a proportional representation democratic system. So you would vote for a party at the national level rather than for an individual at the local level. Once all the votes were counted, the party would receive a certain number of seats in the Reichstag, which it would then dish out to its candidates. This was supposedly good on the one hand because it meant that the seats in the Reichstag truly represented what the people had voted for. So if 10% of the voters had voted for the Blue Party, then the Blue Party would get roughly 10% of the votes. That's not how the US or UK voting system works at all, which then leads to two-party dominance of the political system. The disadvantage of a proportional system is that it tends to produce a parliament with many different party delegations, some of them small. This can make it hard to produce stable administrations. The Weimar Republic suffered greatly from this ailment. So we have a lot of small parties vying for power, and most of them didn't see eye to eye, which destabilised the government system. However, there are a few trends to take note of, and most of the voters tended to vote for the top six or so parties anyway. Therefore, who could they have voted for in 1930? Well, they could have voted for the Social Democratic Party, the SPD which stood for socialism, the welfare state, and democracy. But this party had been the one which had dominated Germany since the fall of the Kaiser, and was the one that was closely associated with the Weimar Republic, since it had created it. In November 1918, before the armistice that ended the First World War, there was a revolution. Sailors mutinied, then the country uprose, and the royal houses across Germany were forced to abdicate. The Kaiser was forced to abdicate as well, and then the Social Democrats seized power in the capital on the 9th of November. Now, because of the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War, 
and the death and starvation that Lenin's economic policies were causing in the East, the Social Democrats decided only to enact a political revolution rather than a social revolution. They didn't want Germany to end up torn apart like Russia was under Lenin. Of course, in public, Ebert and his majority Social Democrats preached the end of capitalism. The alternative to the social revolution was a social agreement. So they decided to call for elections and draw up a constitution, the Weimar Republic's constitution. On the 19th of January 1919, the Social Democrats got 36% of the vote. A record that no German party, including Hitler's, would surpass in a free election until 1957. The other parties committed to creating a new democracy, the Catholic Centre Party and the left liberal German Democratic Party, earned 19.7% and 18.6% of the vote, respectively, meaning that more than three quarters of Germans had cast their votes for progressive democratic politics. So, in 1919, people wanted democracy. They also wanted pensions, unemployment benefits, national insurance policies, and a host of other socialist and labour reforms, such as the eight-hour workday. But by 1923, the cost of these programmes was very high. The only way that Germany could get itself out of its internal debts and spending crisis that it had got itself into was to hyperinflate the currency supply. This would reduce its internal debts, which it did, and free up the Republic to continue with its social reforms. Hyperinflation was self-inflicted. Every mark was printed by Germans and issued by a central bank that was governed by Germans under a government that was purely German. It was German political parties, such as the Socialists, the Catholic Centre Party and the Democrats, forming various coalition governments that were solely responsible for the policies they conducted. Of course, admission of responsibility for any calamity cannot be expected from any political party. They then pretend it was because of France and reparations. Even though those reparations couldn't be paid for in Reichsmarks, and that doesn't make any sense anyway since high inflation had been a thing before the Versailles Treaty had even been signed. Inflation of the currency supply from this era onwards only comes from one place, and one place only, the central bank. In this case, the German central bank, the Reichsbank. In reality, in order to pay off its domestic debts and social obligations, the Weimar Social Republic used the power of inflation, counterfeiting currency, to steal wealth off everyone else in society, redistribute it to itself, and then blame it on a foreign power. And it worked perfectly. It destroyed the German middle class, who voted for democracy, capitalism and liberalism, but now had no reason to do so, and convinced most economically illiterate historians from then until now that France was to blame for hyperinflation, rather than government overspending and overconsumption. Perfect. But by 1930, the German people still felt that something was wrong with the Weimar Republic. They had gone through hyperinflation, and now capitalism was now supposedly in crisis again. The SPD were now seen as the defenders of a corrupt system of government. In 1933, after 15 years of political responsibility, Germany's Social Democrats were a pale, timid shadow of their revolutionary pre-1914 selves. And they were dramatically less popular with the electorate, 
their vote share in national elections having fallen from nearly 39% in 1919 to 20% in 1932. So, people didn't like the crisis that the Weimar Republic had created. Therefore, they didn't cast their vote towards the SPD. In 1930, the number of seats in the Reichstag that the SPD had declined from 153 to 143, reflecting an increasing hostility to the Weimar Republic. However, the workers continued to vote for the SPD, especially unionized workers, since there was a strong tradition of voting for this party among the workers. But you could have voted for the German Communist Party, the KPD, as a radical socialist party and in favour of what Marxists call real democracy, collective control of the means of production, and social revolution. In fact, many of the unemployed did vote for the communists, raising the number of seats they held in the Reichstag from 55 to 77. However, the problem was that the world had just witnessed the bloody Russian Revolution in 1917, and Lenin's subsequent annihilation of his own economy shortly thereafter. In 1930, the German people, on a whole, still didn't want to lose their property, didn't want a violent or bloody revolution or civil war, and were generally fearful of Russian socialism, also known as Bolshevism. Therefore, the unemployed workers tended to vote for the Marxist socialists, simply because they had nothing to lose and everything to gain. The employed or unionized workers did not vote for them. Now, the people could have voted for the Zentrum Party, also known as the Catholic Centre Party, which Chancellor Bruning had been part of. The problem was that this party had a pretty solid base that didn't really move much, since it was based largely in the south of Germany and was predominantly Catholic in nature. Their policies remained largely conservative and capitalist, which wasn't what the majority of the German people were now wanting. They wanted something more substantial and radical. So the Zentrum Party did gain a few seats, going from 62 to 68, but not a lot. The DNVP, or German National People's Party, was another alternative. This was seen as a conservative and middle-class party, with some nationalism thrown in. Again, not radical. And, in fact, the DNVP went from 73 seats to 41 as a result. The DVP, German People's Party, a conservative and liberal party in the old-fashioned sense, went from 45 to 31 seats as well. So, hopefully you can see what's happened here. During the recession, people were looking for an alternative from the old liberal, capitalist and conservative policies and parties. And they didn't want laissez-faire, they wanted a strong state that could take over the economy and sort out the crisis. So, their votes went to the parties that were offering the strongest and fastest solutions to the economic depression. The people, as ever ignorant of basic economics, thought that the solution to bad socialist economic policies was dictatorship and even more socialist economic policies. They therefore voted for the communists, to some extent, but mainly the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The Nazis gained their most spectacular success in the September of 1930 election, where they went from 12 seats in the Reichstag to 107. That's an overnight increase of 95 seats from the previous election in 1928, which was before the onset of the Great Depression. They overtook the Marxists in the KPD, and became the second largest party after the Social Democratic Party. This then set them in a good place to rise even further in the next elections. 
As Evans describes, the Marxists of the KPD got the unemployed workers' vote, but the Nazis got the employed workers' vote, including those of the self-employed. These feared the, a Bolshevik takeover and seizure of their property, property that they had worked hard for. Where the social democratic or communist tradition was strong, unionization high, and labor movement culture active and well supported, the cohesive power of the socialist milieu generally proved resistant to the Nazis' appeal. The Nazis, in other words, reached parts of the working class that the traditional left-wing parties failed to reach. The Nazis also got votes from the white-collar workers, shopkeepers, small businessmen, farmers, civil servants, women, and first-time voters. They did get some professional and bourgeois votes as well, and this has led historians to conclude that the Nazis had a broad appeal, which they did. However, this broad appeal has left historians flummoxed. If the Nazis were popular in all social classes, then what kind of party were they? Worse, the Marxist explanation that Hitler's party was a bourgeois party doesn't hold up, since the middle class vote was also split. Middle class voters, still repelled by the Nazis' violence and extremism, turned to splinter groups of the right, increasing their representation in the Reichstag from 20 seats to 55, but substantial numbers also flocked to the Nazi banner in September 1930. Evans also points out that, even as late as 1932, the Nazis still didn't get much support from the large industrialists, who were disappointed by the vagueness of Hitler's economic policies. In fact, against what the mainstream consensus says, the Nazi party was mostly funded by the grassroots of the Nazi party. Even into the depression, people were charged entrance fees to hear Nazi speakers speak. And this was where the majority of the money came from. This is also why the KPD was largely unsuccessful since they attracted the unemployed. And the unemployed don't have much money to give to the Marxist party. So, the Marxists are broke, appeal to the broke, and have broken economic policies. It's no one the Marxists want to steal other people's property. And clearly, there has to be another explanation here for the rise of the Nazis. Hitler's Germany is unique among all regimes in human history, in at least one respect. Serious historians are unanimous in judging it a catastrophe with no redeeming features. There is no other regime, not even the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, that can claim such a dubious distinction. This is an author who needs to do more research. Serious historians judge several regimes as being a complete disaster. The Soviet Union under Lenin and Stalin, Cambodia under Pol Pot, or Mao's China. So I'm not sure why he's saying that this is not the case, unless he's trying to deny the hundreds of millions of deaths those regimes caused. Anyway, but that is also where agreement ends. Hitler's Germany is a kind of historical Rorschach test. We project onto it whatever we believe to be the worst conceivable political features. What you think those might be depends on who you are. Not everyone sees it the same way. This kind of projection affects explanations on how Hitler's regime came about, and this means that historians have always offered contradictory narratives of the fall of the Weimar Republic. And, as I have always said, where there's a contradiction, there's a distortion of history. It does appear that historians are dancing around the most obvious explanation, an explanation that gets rid of all the contradictions. The Nazi ideology and goals were always deliberately vague and always changing. Hitler announced the 25 points of the Nazi program with much fanfare in 1920, and sternly declared them unchangeable. 
He then ignored them, and they bore little relation to what he did once he reached power. And as I said earlier, this is a historian who hasn't read Mein Kampf. For a fight, it will have to be, since the first objective will not be to build up the idea of the people's state, but rather to wipe out the Jewish state which is now in existence. As so often happens in the course of history, the main difficulty is not to establish a new order of things, but to clear the ground for its establishment. And there you go. Hitler saying, before he got into power, that he was going to destroy the Jewish state, meaning the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union and the international Jewish capital, before he was going to implement his version of socialism. He can't implement full socialism without clearing the ground first, and without taking the living space and resources of the East, which he thought was needed in order to implement full socialism. As Zeitelman points out, the limited autarky that Hitler brings into being before the conquest of the East was just a limited temporary measure that wasn't full autarky. Only after the conquest of living space would Hitler be able to create full autarky. Autarky means economic self-sufficiency, and is closely tied with the idea of socialism, which is why Lenin and Stalin, as well as syndicalists in Spain and so on, also try to implement it. So, when Hitler says he's going to implement his 25 points, he really was, but would only do it fully after the conquest of Russia. Before then, he only implements a limited socialism. However, the voters in the early 1930s were being promised everything they wanted by the Nazis. From the promise of the unification of all Germans as part of a greater Germany, to the conquest of living space, the ending of a corrupt democracy, the establishment of a strong state, equal rights for Germans, full employment, the nationalisation of businesses and the redistribution of these businesses from foreign to German nationals, the sharing of profit, a welfare state, a strong education service and a national army, and the exclusion or removal of non-Germans after seizing their land and property for the German people. It's hard to see why the German voters wouldn't desire this in 1930. And the Nazis achieved most of what they wrote down in the points, with the obvious exception of the fact that they lost the war and thus couldn't implement all the policies relating to Eastern conquest. The German people were voting for a radical solution to the crisis of capitalism. They wanted a radical version of socialism on the national or racial level, with the promise of full employment, a strong army, a redistribution of wealth, of land, of businesses, etc. And unlike the communists, the National Socialists wanted to do this legally, without the destructive civil war and economic failures and famines that the Marxists in the Soviet Union had done. So this was a socialism that was not Bolshevism, and was designed specifically for the German people. And since the Germans were sick of democracy, sick of liberalism, sick of capitalism, and sick of being dominated by foreign powers, the National Socialist German Workers' Party was the only viable party for them. So this wasn't an accident. And this isn't unexplainable, as some historians seem to make it out as being. The National Socialists had some very concrete policies that resonated with the German people. And this was a failure of democracy. Democracy votes in socialism, and socialism always fails. The economically ignorant vote themselves broke. The only reason Hitler's economy didn't self-implode was because he robbed the economic resources of the whole of conquered Europe to keep the thing afloat. And it was still a poor economy. Now, the, there will no doubt be counter-arguments to this. The Marxists will still hold dearly onto the idea that National Socialism was right-wing capitalism. 
But this makes no sense. The Great Depression was seen as a failure of capitalism, so... If Hitler was a capitalist, which Marxists think he was, why would the German people vote for him? The excuse given is that he tricked the workers, but then he implemented many of the socialist policies and did murder the Jews, which he saw as the evil behind capitalism. So this excuse, which people continue to take seriously for ideological reasons, is contradictory and doesn't hold up to scrutiny. It makes explaining the era in question completely unexplainable, which is why historians are having a hard time of it. And what really frustrates me is that historians are currently skirting around the ideology of National Socialism and have come to the conclusion that its policies and ideology were vague. These vaguists are dancing around the burning red fire at the heart of the Nazi ideology, in the hope that nobody will notice the heat. They can't define National Socialism. They can't define Fascism, which is a different ideology, but they don't think it is, even though they don't know what it is. They can't explain why anyone voted for Hitler. They can't explain what policies the Nazis had or why. And they pretend that National Socialism had no substance at all. But the reality is that some historians, myself included, have defined National Socialism and know it contains socialism at the heart of it. The National Socialist German Workers' Party had a concrete socialist agenda that called for a racial collective in a greater Germany and that they appealed to many Germans who were frustrated with the terrible democratic socialist republic they found themselves in. Pretending that it wasn't socialism 80 years after the events in question is shameful at best and dishonest at worst. <laughs>